Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, uh, the lead pastor here. Really glad all of you are worshiping with us today. We're kind of working our way through our Christmas series. I don't know if you know this, saw this on the way in, if you saw. Uh, we've been trying to raise about $80,000 for a new soundboard, some stuff in our kids, some stuff for missions. We crossed over the uh, threshold. We, we did it, so you did it. Great job. Uh, very excited about that. It's actually our first Sunday with the new soundboard, which has been great. And I don't know if you saw in Grove Kids that uh, we've already started some of, the, uh, some of the painting back there. It looks really great. So again, just thanks to all of you guys. Who's ex- you, you got, do you guys get excited for Christmas or are you like, like bro, that's only kids do? Right? Like I get, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm starting to get excited, right? And, um, and I love this series that we're going to uh, be with you guys in this couple more weeks. Looking forward to Christmas Eve and... I was thinking about this uh, this week. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, get, I can get criticized for, and it's, it's happened a few times, maybe you've never said it out loud, maybe you have to somebody else or whatever, is that sometimes like if I'm talking about something that's kind of controversial, that like it seems like you just, like you were like, you know, too diplomatic, you kind of play both sides, you're not, you're not really willing to take a stand on things, like I should be stronger about things, like I'm, somehow I'm scared of a hot take. So we're going to remedy that here real quick. In order to be considered a Christmas movie, you must meet two conditions. One, it needs to be, right, set at Christmas time. Two, it needs to um, have as its primary themes, Christmas themes. So Christmas themes without it being at Christmas is not a Christmas movie. And set at Christmas without Christmas themes is not a Christmas movie. So as great as it is, as great as Bruce Willis is, as great as Hans Gruber is as one of the best villains of all time, it's just not a Christmas movie. It's a great movie, but it's not a Christmas movie. We just, and we just, we seem to be, you need to be okay with that. And I've already gotten in trouble with this, and it's why I don't, that's why I don't do it. Like, I've already gotten, I got angry texts from first service already, right? I got heckled, first row, first row right here. There was a heckler right here. It was one of, anyways. But you know what? I'll just, just keep it going, Right? Well, there's, so that means that there's another category of Christmas movies that doesn't count either. You know what's not a Christmas theme? Uh, the hotshot lawyer from the big city goes back to visit her hometown, and her fiancé can't come, but she meets this insanely, ridiculously good-looking guy who happens to live in a small town and happens to own a bed and breakfast, and she finds true love in the small town. That's not Christmas. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a Christmas movie. It's like, they'd be perfectly fine. You've watched those things all day long. Binge watch the same movie. I'm never going to judge anybody for watching a movie that has the same things going on. That's what, that's what I do. I'm totally in Fast and Furious 37. I'll keep watching it. I just, it's fine. It's fine. I'm not judging you. It's just not a, it's just not a Christmas movie, right? So we can fight about this later if you'd like. Um, but what are Christmas themes then, right? Big one, right? The power of belief. Belief. Right, the, the, it's the belief in the Christmas spirit, right? That powers Santa's sleigh, right? It's the, it's the theme of <laughs> theme of Elf, and coincidentally, um, also the theme of the newly released Christmas blockbuster, Violent Night, where it is essentially, it's essentially, it's like it's like they, it's, let's make Die Hard, but make it with the the good guy is in fact Santa Claus, which is it's it's, it's ridiculous. If you, I don't think you may not even know what I'm talking about. It is an action movie where the the hero of it is literally the literal Santa Claus, and he saves the the hostages. And it is the power of belief that makes everything win at the end. And it is it's as bad as you think it is. And so I saw it. So you, no, as I said, of course I didn't see it. It's R-rated, and I'm a pastor. Never see a movie that was just violent. Anyway, so what are the themes, right? Belief, belief, hope, peace, joy, right? Things that are just kind of like, like, like that, that, that draw us to the Christmas story. A, a hope that we can have, peace that we can have in chaos, an, an indescribable joy. These are the Christmas things. You hear the story of Mary and the peace that she has as she's, you know, she's having to give birth under these in, in, incredibly insane circumstances in a barn, but the joy that she has for the baby and, and, and how overwhelmed she is when the, when the shepherds come and the peace and the joy and the life that is there, right? These are the Christmas themes. And again, we make these movies and TV shows and, and, we, take, and we take those things. And the series that we've been doing over the last few weeks, we've been going through Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew's about to tell his version 
you know, as the, 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 the highlights of the Christmas story from his perspective. But before he does that in Matthew chapter 1, he goes through Jesus' genealogy. He says, this was his great granddad, had this son, who had this son, who had this son, who had this son, who had this son. And so he's doing that to kind of set up kind of who Jesus is. And in the process, highlights just a handful of stories by, instead of going, whose son was, whose son was, whose son was, he mentions five women by name. In part to just draw attention to how great these women are, but really, I think, and most people believe, to kind of highlight some particular stories. When you think about what it means that Jesus Christ has come into the world, I want you to remember this story, and this story, and this story, because these, these are the themes. These are the themes that God is wanting us to have in our heart as we think about how great it is that Jesus Christ has come into the world. And so two weeks ago, we looked at the story of Tamar, and um, really your, your theme is there is that he brings, he brings peace to chaos. In a chaotic situation, God enters in and can bring peace. He can bring peace to these kinds of situations. He brings hope to the forgotten, the isolated, the hurt. And then last week, we looked at the story of David and Bathsheba, what I would say is probably one of the top three most troubling, kind of disturbing stories in all of Scripture. And Matthew's like, hey, remember this when you think about Jesus. You're like, why? Why would we want to do that? Because what we see here is there is hope for a person who has been hurt. When the worst thing in your life is something someone has done to you, if is something someone has done to you, God brings hope. But the, the flip side of it's true also. When the worst things has ever happened in your life is what you have done, the possibility of hope and new life and forgiveness is there. Restoration, forgiveness, life. And we see this in kind of what really, for the first two weeks of the series, were fairly dark stories. I mean, and that is, again, a significant Christmas theme the light that God brings into dark places. Now, we're going to move here <clears throat> over the next couple of weeks to stories that are just a little bit more lighthearted, but we're just going to kind of continue to see some of the same themes and some new themes that, that Matthew and God are really ultimately trying to draw us into as we get ready in our own hearts and our own minds about really what does it mean to celebrate Jesus coming into the world. So again, in Matthew chapter 1, we're walking our way through the genealogy, we get this phrase. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. So we kind of stop here. It's like, and, and who is Ruth? And if you've been going to the Grove more than a year, it's like, hey, I, I think we did this. I think we talked about her already, right? We talked about her very recently. Every fall, we do a, um, a character study of someone from the Old Testament. Very recently, we did Daniel this year. And very recently, we did Ruth. But as is the case with all great franchises, she deserves her very own Christmas episode. So we will now be studying Ruth from a Christmas perspective, and we'll just kind of go big picture here. Let's get our intro to her here in Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malin and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So we start with this guy, Limelech, a Jewish guy who moves to Moab, outside of Israel to another country. And while they are there, Elimelech, he dies, and he leaves a widow, and the widow has two sons. And the two sons marry not Israelite women, not people who are from their nationality, their religion, their culture, married people from where they lived, married two Moabite women. And after they had been married a few years, haven't had any children, um, both of those sons die as well. And so the whole setup for this story, the story of, of Ruth, comes from, well, who is Ruth? Well, Ruth is a woman. She's a Gentile. She's non-Jewish. She's a woman. She's a Gentile. She's a widow, Right? And if you look at sp the specifics of her story, again, I'm not asking you to believe this. I'm just saying that the people who would have experienced this story, knew this story, would, the original readers to this story would say, 
this, this woman is cursed, right? They, they, they went to Moab, and, apparently, and, and if you look at what happened, it looks like that God didn't want them to go. The dad died, both sons died, and now she's a widow, woman, Gentile, who's probably cursed, which makes her, let's just be honest, let's make her what she is. She is a very unlikely hero. She's a very unlikely hero. Gentiles aren't heroes. They were the foreigners. They were, they were outside the family. It was kind of, we probably shouldn't have married a Moabite in the first place. Well, and then look what happened. They both died and they died childless. I mean, this is, I mean, look, this is what happens to people who make these sorts of decisions. And now, and, now, and now she's a widow. And so in the ranking system of who people are and how much value they should have, from the culture that we're living in right now as this story is taking place, a Gentile woman widow would be pretty close to the bottom. And she's going to be the hero of the story. And she undoubtedly is. She is the hero of the story. I mean, it's not just simply named after her. It is, it is who she is. And, it, and it's very unlikely because, you, know, you know, most stories are kind of filled with kind of stereotypical characters, these certain tropes that you always see in all the stories, right? You, you, you watch a show, you watch a movie or whatever, and there's a girl at the school or whatever, and she's got big glasses, and she puts her hair up, and it's messy, and she wears oversized clothes, right? You know, what, you know what's coming, right? I mean, she's going to have some glow-up moment at some point, and you, you kind of look at it and like, uh, you can put all the glasses and do the hair all you want to. I mean, that, this, is an attractive, this is an attractive woman. And you know exactly what's going to happen, right? Or you go into the house of the mom and she yells a lot and she's got an adult son that lives with her in a bedroom and he's playing video games, right? What's that guy? He's, uh, he also just happens to have a, you know, a, a computer system probably valued in $25,000, right? He's the hacker. He's the one that's going to get you in the Pentagon. Da, 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 da. I'm in, right? It's, it's that guy. It's like you, just, you see these same characters over and over again. And again, I'm not going to judge you. I'll go see the same movie 15 times, right? They, they keep making the same movie with the same characters because we will just keep paying money to go see them. But that's why like this, every now and then you get something like, well, that's not who you would expect to be the hero. Judge me if you will, but my youngest daughter, who is 11, she is reading the Hunger Games trilogy right now and loving these, loving these stories. And she, again, she's very, I'm sure she's very captivated by Katniss, a, 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 young, a young girl who becomes a very unlikely hero from, from the poorest of districts, from the poorest, most lowly of circumstances, ends up becoming this incredible hero of a rebellion. It is the unlikely hero that is a very compelling story and that's what we have here in Ruth. But what is that, how does that connect to Jesus? Well, it connects perfectly to the Christmas story. If I were to tell you that the King of Kings is about to come into the world, into the Jewish world, to bring hope to the people who have been living in an oppressed kind of controlled society, an occupied nation for generations, and the King of Kings is about to enter in to bring hope to the people, that is not a story of an insignificant baby born in a barn to parents who were no one. Class-wise, power, wealth, they were, they were no ones. At this moment, from the world's perspective, in the moment that Jesus comes into the world, he is a no one born to nobody. And that is not who you expect Jesus to be. And you'll see that all throughout the Gospels, the interaction that they have, who he is, what he does, what he values, the people that he loves, all of it is unexpected. That he is an unlikely hero, loving, unlikely people, a person born in incredibly humble circumstances, who loves the people at the bottom, the people who are outcasts because of illness, because of their nationality, because of their sin, because of their social status, the people that Jesus had a, 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 a big heart for. So we've seen this actually all three weeks. All three of these women, for one reason or another, are not, are, are not doing well, are not the kinds of people that are supposed to be elevated. And Matthew says, remember them when you think of Jesus. 
an unlikely hero in and of himself who loves people that were considered to be the unlovable ones. And so, Naomi, after all this happens, she's lost her husband, now lost her sons, doesn't have you know, any, other, any other sons, any other children, no grandchildren. It's just her in a foreign country with her two foreign uh, daughters-in-law. And so she looks at him and says, hey, listen, the only hope I really have is to go back home and maybe to receive some charity, some people from my extended family. You're, you're, you're still relatively young. You go back, you live with your dad. You go back, live with your dad. Your dad will take care of you. Your dad will be able to find you a husband and you can have, li- you can, you can have the life that you, that you deserve. So this is goodbye for us. You just, you got to stay here and I'm going. And Orpah, she does that. She's very sad. She loves Naomi, but she goes. But Ruth hears her say this and says, no way, this is not what I'm doing. And, and Naomi is begging her, and you need to go. And this is what Ruth says to her. Ruth chapter one, verse 16. <clears throat> but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. He's like, hey, you need to go. Just stay, you just stay here. Go back to your family. I'm going to leave. Don't follow me. He's like, there's absolutely no way I'm going to do that. I am with you to the end. Wherever you are, that's where I live. Whoever your people are, that's who my people will be. I'm going to worship your God and only death, only death will separate the two of us. And let God, let God, let God judge me if this ends up not being what I do. And so we see from Ruth this very unlikely hero, someone you do not expect to kind of go above and beyond. What we see in her is this incredible sacrificial love. The sacrificial love that she has where she's like, I am going to, I'm going to lay down my best chance. And really, apart from God just kind of doing something really, really cool here, the really only chance she had at like the good life like what was what what did she want from life? Like what was the right? Like what life was is you, you she she should get married and she should have kids and be a mom and have this family. It's like your only chance for that life, real life, is for you to stay here. If you come with me, I've got no sons to give you. There's nothing that I can do for you. And her overwhelming loyalty and love for her mother-in-law. I will never abandon you. And I, I, you, just, you just think about this, and, you know, and, it, and again, it, it, reads like, it reads like wedding vows. It reads like the things that you would say to, to, your, to your kids. And I'm not trying to do a bit here. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a little bit. I love my mother-in-law, right? I mean, like, but this, is, this is her mother-in-law. This is her mother-in-law. I'm going to sacrifice my entire life for her. Like when I think about this kind of compelling love, again, I love her, but that's not where I go. I think of my wife, I think of my kids. I think of Christmas 1997, the story that is now almost 25 years old. Uh, The the, the birth of our firstborn, our, our, our little Christmas baby. And um, we had a pretty uneventful pregnancy and a pretty uneventful uh, delivery up until the point. You know, she was, Heidi was progressing fine. Everything was going fine. Then she started pushing and everything seemed to be going fine. And then the chillest, most calm doctor person I've ever met in my life, our, our Heidi's ob he comes in and Heidi asks him a question. He just loses it. And I'm like, this, this isn't, this isn't a, what, what, what's wrong? And I'm telling you, 10 minutes later, we were in the, oper- the operating room. And Maylee was in, in distress. Her vitals were going wild. And next thing you know, we were in a C-section. And in my heart, like everything, everything's, everything's just out of control. My wife is completely vulnerable. They're telling me my baby is, is in trouble. And they take her and, and they take her to another place. And I, I can't hear her. I can't see her. And I'm just completely overwhelmed. And God shows up big time. Everybody ends up being okay. It was really only maybe 
20, 30 minutes. By the time they had Heidi all sewed up back together, they were bringing Maley back to us. But because of the circumstances of this and the emergency of the C-section and the way the medicine was delayed and kick, kicking in, by the time we got back to the room, Heidi was just, she was, she was passed out. And I'm not judging her. It's, 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 it's kind of funny. I mean, she was just kind of just like this, and it's just, it's just me and the baby, right? And we, we, have, we have dispute about this. About, she talks about all the memories that she has of kind of you know, Maylee's first bath, and I was like, man, I, I was there. I was there. You might remember Maylee's third bath, but first bath, you were like this. We, but she's like, no, no, no. I was like, I think you just heard me describe it. We, we, 25 years later, we're still fighting. But because I think in part because of Maylee's personality, you think, what do you mean personality? She's 45 minutes old. I was like, because of her personality and just I think because of the shock of all of this, I've never seen a baby this young be this awake and this clear. I'm holding her. It's just me and her and Heidi's asleep and I'm just holding her and, and she's just looking at me like this. I'm telling you, I'm just... I mean, and you say, and, and everything we know about her, I mean, she's figuring it out. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you supposed to be? What's your deal? And what felt to me, it could have been two minutes. It could have been 10 hours. I just, I just stared at this beautiful little baby girl who in that moment I would have given anything for. I will, I will do anything, be anything, do whatever I have to do to protect and love this precious baby girl. That's the only story I can think of really like my marriage, my marriage vows, this, my, the, the birth of my children, the adopting of Layla, our youngest. These are the stories that I have to tell to get anywhere close to this thing that this unlikely hero Ruth does for her mother-in-law who had nothing to give her. And this is who our Jesus is. Philippians 2 describes him as being equal with God. And it says he didn't regard that. Basically, depending on what your translation says, it says a lot of translations really kind of struggle with really kind of capturing this. But essentially what it says is like, he didn't really consider that worth thinking about. It just wasn't that big of a deal to him. And so instead of just do it living there, it says that he emptied himself and was born a baby as a servant to die a horrible death. Did not regard what was going to be in his best interest because what he believed to be in his best interest was to sacrifice what seemed to be good for him for the love and good of us. And that is what we see with the love that Ruth has for her mother-in-law. And so when you think of this, you think of Jesus. This is what Matthew says, hey, remember this story because this is who Jesus is. So the story continues, so she does. She goes back with Naomi, they go back to Israel. And again, they don't have any abilities to wipe the witch to, to make any money, really. They don't, have, they don't have any land that they can take care of themselves. So the only way that they were able to eat is they, you know, there was kind of a generosity program that was part of their culture where, 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 where widows could go to you know, rich people's fields and kind of walk behind the people who were gathering their crops and anything that was kind of laid, laid out, they could, they could gather it up and take it home to eat. And so she was doing this. The sacrificial love continues. I'm, I will go out and do this for you, Naomi, so that we can eat. And she would, she would do this every day. And she caught the eye of a guy named Boaz, who was the guy who owned the, the, um, who owned the land. He's like, who is that? So, well, that's Ruth. Well, he knew her story. And he goes and talks to her. He's like, I know who you are. And the story of your overwhelming love for Naomi is well known. You don't go to any other fields. You go to me. I'll make sure you always have enough of what you need. I want to make sure. And he told his servants, hey, hey, when you see her out there behind you, you not only do you not go back and pick up, pick up what you drop, drop more for them. Just out of his own desire to kind of honor someone who had loved so well. 
And so she goes back and tells Naomi about this, kind of what the process is. Hey, this is what happened. I met this guy named Boaz. And she's like, hey, this actually, this actually could be really good for us because he has the ability to be, again, what your translation may say, a kinsman or a guardian redeemer for our family. What is that, you might say? Well, if you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the story of, of Tamar, whose husband died before she had kids, and it was the responsibility of the next brother to take her as a wife so that she could have kids and that those kids would carry on the legacy, not of the second husband, but of the first husband. And I kind of brushed past that really quick. It's really weird. It's a really weird cultural tradition. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense from us. But in that culture, it, did, it made perfect sense to them. It's like, we want to make sure that, that, that a dead person does not lose their inheritance just because they died before they were able to have kids. We want to honor them so that no one has to lose what, what, what belongs to them. You know, it sounds, sounds weird. But, you know, Naomi, that's what Naomi says, I don't have any son. I don't have any more sons to do this for you. So now, in order for someone to do this, we have to look at cousins. But they don't have to, right? They don't have to do it. But Naomi says, this, this could be a guy that does that for us. And so they come up with this plan for, essentially, for Ruth to kind of flirt with them a little bit. And he's really kind of taken aback by it. And basically says, I'm old and ugly, and you're like young and cute, and I can't believe that you would do this. Essentially saying, you could do a whole lot better for yourself, but you're not looking out for yourself. You're, again, you're wanting to take care of your mother-in-law and honor your dead husband. And so he's like, I I, I, I want to do this for you, but there's actually, I'm your third cousin once removed. There's a second cousin once removed. It's not exactly what it says, but same basic idea. There's There's another cousin who's got a better claim to this. He's like, so, okay. He goes to him, and it's, it's smooth. What Boaz does here is crazy smooth. It's like, yeah, there's a piece of property over here that you can buy. It belongs to Naomi and their family. I was going to buy it, but you have the opportunity to buy it. If you want to buy it, you can buy it. You can totally buy it. You're like, yeah, man, I want some land. I'll buy that land. Oh, forgot to tell you, it comes with a wife. And you won't really own the land, the sons that you will have with her, she gets to own the land. They, and those sons won't belong to you, and the land won't belong to you. Do you still want to buy the land? He's like, like and it, it, his reaction is like, of course I don't want to do that. It would, it, would, it would like put everything that I have at risk for someone that doesn't even really belong to me. Of course I'm not going to do that. It would be a ridiculous sacrifice from his perspective. Limbo S says this, verse 9, chapter 4. And Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. So we got Ruth, the unlikely hero. Ruth with a sacrificial love, and now we enter Boaz as the guardian redeemer. The one who says, I will sacrifice everything that is mine for you. I'm going to buy land that will never truly belong to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have kids that will be in someone else's lineage, and I'm gonna secure an inheritance for people for another family at great cost to me. Again, out of a love for Ruth and a a, a desire to see a family who just has had a lot of things happen to them, to redeem them, to restore them, to bring them life and hope and what has been a hopeless 10, 15 years for them. That he saw them at their worst. He saw them at their most desperate. He saw them when they were hopeless and sad and they didn't have any options. And so at great sacrifice to himself, he brings life to them. He pays for them. He literally pays a price of sacrifice in order for them to have new life. So when you think of Jesus, remember this story. The one who, out of 
no personal benefit to himself, sacrifices himself so that we might have life, so that we might be redeemed, so that he could pay for us, so that we could be then elevated out of a poor and desperate situation to become, according to scriptures, adopted sons and daughters of God, to be Jesus' brothers and sisters. He sacrificed himself to simply out of love for us so that we might have something that we didn't. He did not regard his high estate, his position here. He didn't regard it. What he regarded was how bad a situation we were in. That's what he thought about. This is what matters. And I'm going to sacrifice me for you. We see it in Boaz as kind of this literal guardian redeemer from the, in this cultural tradition that they have. We see it in Ruth as well. We see these people who are sacrificing for someone else out of just a great deep love. And this is our Jesus. This is who we worship. This is who we celebrate this Christmas. Now, it's been a weird couple of years with COVID. And if, if you're new, you may not even know this. We've always got, we've got this response area in the back. And when things were just kind of weird about being crowded, we didn't really draw a lot of attention to it. But if you knew it was there, it was there. So I want you to make sure that you're all aware of it. We've got communion that is there available every week for you to take to where you can just kind of reflect and think about Jesus, his death and his sacrifice for you. There's prayer candles where you can pray. There's people that want to pray with you. There's a cross where you can kneel and pray. There's lots of places, ways to respond. And we always finish our service with worship as a way really of kind of responding to what we hear and what we're learning about who God is, who Jesus is, the way that he loves and interacts with me. So let's have a response day whether it be where you are or you go in the back, where I just really want to take some time to worship, to worship this unlikely hero who loves us sacrificially and for each one of us is our guardian redeemer. Let me pray. God, again, I, I just, I am so thankful for these stories. God, how beautiful they are individually and God, how they all weave together the incredible foreshadowing and anticipation of what you are going to do in our lives through your son, Jesus Christ. We just see it in story after story after story. And we are so thankful for him that he did not regard what was in his interest, what would have been best for him, what would have been safest for him, most comfortable for him, but motivated out of a love for us, emptied himself and became a baby and ultimately gave his life. And so God, I pray that we would respond to that with overwhelming gratitude and worship this morning. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.